And I'd suggest to you, you know, why aren't we doing better? I think it's because our can the green campaign has been defined in the negative. Uh, Ontarians know what you don't like, but they don't see the vision. They don't see what a sustainable green society would look at. I think it's essential that the, the green community has got, the people pursuing this end, you've got to get together and cast that, that green vision so that people understand what it is that Ontario will look like and what their lives will be like once we get there. There's some other points here, but let me emphasize this. The nuclear industry has an energy vision for Ontario. It is, and yes, they have lots of money, but that's, but you, it's not just money that it helps you sell a vision. They have a vision, it's clear, it's communicated, and it solves all the problems, in, in at least their line of argument. And that's what you're competing against. Even the fossil fuel electrical generation components of OPG have a vision for why, how they fit in, where they will exist, what, how they will affect this society, and why they are essential. So when you're up against things, you're up against these powerful v opposing visions. And what I don't think, uh, sitting on the side in my observer position, I mean, I know, I mean, I've been working on this stuff for 30 years. I mean, you, you know, I, I've been reading all this stuff and do, you know, looking at things. So I have, I have my own sort of personal idea of what it would look like, and, and it's probably pretty good, and a lot of you people have been committed for a long period of time, and you, you do too, but what I'm saying is, what are we casting out to the public? What does the public's vision see? And I think they see a little fog there, a little confusion, which is easy to play the fear on, eh? If you don't really know what they're talking about, then, boy, that's really comfortable to be in that nuclear lobby, because we need to know what they're talking about. And we have to get this together in this vision, we have to deal with the constraints and the problems in the existing electrical system, especially if it's all electrical in this part, but uh, you could make the same argument with gas. Things like like peak load, you know, the peak load is a real problem, and, and it's all well and good to talk about alternate energy and all these things, but, you know, it's not obvious how we're going to address peak load. There are technologies to do this, by the way. You can, you can no, I don't know why they don't talk about this much in Ontario, but you can store wind energy and, and some of these new storage technologies and things and deal with peak load. But what we're not talking, I don't hear that coming back to me. I know that because I read all the scientific journals and that sort of stuff, but I don't hear that coming back to me, you know, through the, through the media or through the, through the public. So peak load, uh, base load issues, things like really mundane engineering stuff like voltage support, you know, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with these, these technical terms, you know, basically you, you have to put power into the grid at various points to keep the, the voltage up to a level that, that runs things properly as you get really your practical things going wrong with your mo motors and your machines. So, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's all engineering geek stuff, but, but when you cast the green vision, some of those engineering geeks who are in very powerful positions say, well, what about voltage support? Well, you gotta have an answer, right? I, I think there are answers, but you gotta have them. Uh, transmission bottlenecks, that's, you know, that's a real problem. Transmission is a big thing in Ontario. Interestingly enough, even though I just said the nuclear's got this vision, everybody's got this vision, it sounds like they've got their, their stuff together. But, you know, this recent, um, the recent buy of, or the rebuild and the, the power purchase agreement with uh, Bruce Power, uh, government almost got caught with their pants around their ankles on that one because they agreed to buy all this power on these particular dates and it was a commitment, a hard commitment, and then somebody realized that the transmission line down from the Bruce wouldn't carry the power. For a little while here, the government was in a position of having to pay for a nuclear energy that they wouldn't even be able to get because they didn't think about the power lines. And, and that's a, no, that's why there was, you know, if you read the paper, there's a big scramble to extend the, increase the transmission capacity up to the Bruce, and that will be fixed apparently in time, but at the cost of a fantastic amount of money. But transmission are part of the, part of the, the, the thing, they're part of the problem, they're the constraints in the system. And then we get into the industrial needs and, you know, the, what do industries need and that kind of, but that's our economy, that's, you know, it's a starting point. So anybody that casts a vision for a, a green future, a green energy future Ontario has to be able to capture those things somehow and communicate them so people aren't afraid. Plus, we must provide for a system for trans trans transition. I mean, we can't deny what we've got. We've got a bunch of, we've got a bunch of nuclear power plants and we've got a bunch of coal fired stations and, you know, we've got this uh, hard path grid uh, out there, and if we're going to go to a green s future with a soft path of distributed generation and uh, all these other good and necessary things, you got to think about how we get from, he th from here to there. And when some of the things that I think are neglected is that, is that you know, 
I mentioned already the fact that the grid has got to be changed to accommodate this, and it's got to be thought about. But also, the re, one of the one of the challenges is if we, you know, it's, it's, it's we talk about closing the coal plants. You close those coal plants, there's millions of dollars of, of, of assets that are stranded, asset value that, you know, if you like money that's borrowed and has to be paid for and things, and you have to cope with that. I mean, and you can, and we're rich enough problems, we can write it off, but, but you have to address that. You know, what are we going to do with all those stranded assets? But the part that's a little harder to address is this one. Have you noticed the power workers union has been very, very vocal on, on the whole coal question and things? Well, you know, just down at, uh, you know, down at Nanakook, down at Nanticoke, on the shore of Lake Erie, I don't know if you've ever been down there, there's just nothing, there's, there's nothing, it's beautiful farmland, very lightly populated part of Ontario, there's, a, there's the, the power plant and a, a, a petroleum refinery and a steel mill, but there's 600 people, 600 families take income from that, co from that, that coal plant, largest coal plant in North America, and 600 people. We close it tomorrow, we got 600 quality jobs and 600 families that lose a major income, where in Haldeman, and Norfolk, where they have zero possibility of getting another high-paying industrial job. I mean, they, the, the steel mill and the, the uh, petroleum refinery pick up maybe, you know, a dozen, some small number. So, so what, we, you've got to transition those people. We've got to, we've got to think about what, what is going to happen down in, on Lake Erie at Nanakoke uh, when that coal plant closes, if we close it prematurely. And, and that kind of, that's just one example, but, you know, that repeats itself uh, other places where we change the system. So, you see my point. We, you got to have this vision. It's got to cast something positive for the people. It's got to give them an idea what the future would look like. It's got to, but it's got to deal with the problems and it's got to allow for transition. And I think if we do, you know, if I hear that coming back from the system, I think that's so much easier to, to sell to the public. So the strategy is, is to form a consensus because there, there is a lack of consensus on sustainable green energy. Uh, sell a vision to the people and work together for any, uh, to support any initiatives that, that move us towards that. That's how you do incrementally, right? And once you have the vision, you say, okay, well, here's something we can support. Here's something we can pursue and, and work that way. And that way will focus the limited energy and resources that uh, you got, your groups have. You don't have the billions of dollars that, that the, uh, the, the nuclear people have. Uh, you don't have the, you know, the, the depth of, of, uh, of time and, and energy some of these uh, big energy firms have. So uh, it's a way of, of focusing and proving that. But, uh, but I really do think that at this particular juncture of time in Ontario, the public is ready to hear. Well, many of you have been doing this for 30 years, I know, and you know, you've never had a better opportunity right now. The people out there are ready to hear and listen about a new green energy, uh, sustainable energy future for Ontario, and they're just saying, okay, show us the vision. So I, I implore you, I exhort you, as you, not maybe coming out of today, but you know, but as, as a result of what you do today and the coming days and weeks, pull together for a clear, sustainable green energy vision for, for Ontario. Bring that forward and I think you'll be well received and I think uh, then people like the Environmental Commissioner can say, oh, look at those guys, that's a good idea. Thanks. <laughs>